Yes, you can. A podcast for high achievers. Hi, I'm Tammy North. I'm the owner of the Genuine Driven Women brand of businesses. The goal of this podcast is to help you become the best that you can be. Don't ever doubt the power you have to make the world a better place. Yes, you can make a difference. Today we're going to talk about how you can be a multiplier. One of my favorite quotes by Maya Angelou says that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I think that this concept of being a multiplier goes right along with that. And as you are growing and becoming and improving as a leader, then I'd really like you to go forward with the concept of a multiplier in mind. So in my episode about senior leaders losing self-awareness from season two, I mentioned the book Multipliers and how the best leaders make everyone smarter by Liz Wiseman with Greg McCowan. I heard about this book quite a while before I actually read it and the concept alone immediately immediately resonated with me. Essentially, there's a spectrum of two types of leaders, and at each extreme, you will find either a multiplier or a diminisher. A diminisher will drain all the energy from the room. They are idea killers, energy sappers. They reduce talent and commitment from all those around them. They always have to be the smartest people in the room. But on the opposite end, you'll find a multiplier. When they walk into the room, light bulbs go off over people people's heads, ideas flow, and problems get solved. They inspire others to stretch beyond and deliver results that surpass everyone's expectations. So the way the universe works sometimes, just when I needed it most, this book surprisingly appeared on my desk at work. One of the leaders in my community knew the situation that our team was in and the struggles we were dealing with, and I believe he sent it to me to inspire us and to help shine light within our organization. His blog can be found at seanheritage.com. I'll link it in the show notes. He's a great thought leader who inspires and motivates others to question the status quo and imagine a better future. In this episode, I will talk a bit about the book, though I don't have time to cover all the excellent detail and practical steps that you can take to deal with diminishers or to make sure that you spend most of your time on the multiplier end of the spectrum. So I definitely encourage you to read this book. You'll find that you will see yourself and the others you are around every day in its pages. One word of caution though, you might be surprised at which end of the spectrum between diminisher to multiplier that you fall. As we talk about in this episode, some of the actions we take with the intention of helping others actually does impact people in a diminishing way. So we'll we'll get more into that as the episode goes, but it will be interesting. So don't automatically think that you are a multiplier. I actually automatically thought that, that I was, and there are things I do that are multiplying techniques, but there are also plenty of things I do that are diminishing. And so I these are things I'm working on myself every day to make sure that I'm not killing the ideas around me, and then I'm encouraging my team to share their ideas and to be the best that they can be. The main point of this book is that you can be a multiplier. You can create genius around you, and you can drive others to have a higher contribution. Every place you ever work, you will find that the resources, you know, either people or money, will always be an issue. Even if you work at the top Fortune 500 companies, they are driven to produce a profit, and they are beholden to share shareholders. And if you're in the military or the government, there's not going to be any new money. Our defense budget is large, yes, but it's not getting any bigger. And there's a lot of things that it needs to accomplish. Therefore, you will grow as a leader and you will become a person who's able to produce real tangible results when you learn to use all the talent and intelligence of your entire team and the others around you. There are so many amazing people in our lives every day. And if we learn to appreciate their talents and to draw out their talents, then we are going to get a lot further than if we rely only on ourselves. You will drive others away and hamper the best ideas if you are a diminisher. This will impact your results. It will dampen the business and it will demotivate all those around you. I know who you want to be, and this episode will get you on the right track. A diminisher's view of intelligence comes from a place of scarcity and elitism. They seem to believe that intelligence is rare and that they are one of the few smart people in the room. 
Multipliers have a rich, vibrant view of intelligence around them. They come from a growth mindset and they believe that people are smart and they will figure it out. So here's some of the key findings about multipliers. Multipliers expect great things from people and they will drive people to extraordinary results. They are tough and exacting. Yes, multipliers make people feel smart and capable, but they are not feel-good managers. They look at people, they see their capability, and they see a lot of potential, and therefore, they expect a lot out of you. Multipliers also have a sense of humor because they don't take themselves too seriously, and this is probably because they're confident and they don't feel the need to defend their own intelligence. Once you start having to defend yourself and you're trying to prove how smart you are and you're trying to showcase your knowledge, it's interesting, but you actually come across as insecure. So if you want to be the confident one, try to just relax and don't take yourself too seriously. A multiplier sense of humor is something that liberates others. It relaxes others and it brings people out of their shells. In this book, it'll cover the five disciplines of multipliers. And this is where we're going to get into the heart of the very practical steps you can take to make sure that you are spending more time on the multiplier end of the spectrum. So let's talk about the five multiplier disciplines. The first is the talent magnet. A talent magnet is the opposite of an empire builder. A talent magnet will attract and optimize talent and an empire builder is a diminisher who collects people like knickknacks on a shelf and then sets them aside and underutilizes them. One will create a cycle of growth and one will create a cycle of decline. When you think of somebody that has knickknacks all over their house, most of those people and and all their knickknacks. If you go look at the knickknacks, they're covered in dust. And it's the very same thing. An empire builder will hire the best people, but they kind of get dusty. They let those people just sit around and get dusty. They will probably use those people and their resumes to attract business to their company, but then they will, an empire builder will only use their own mind to make decisions and to solve problems where a talent magnet will attract the best people and then use those people to their fullest ability. So let's talk about a cycle of growth, which is what a talent magnet will create. In a cycle of growth, A-level players, you know, the best players will apply to your organization. They will come to work, they will get fully utilized, and they will grow and improve. Then the A-plus players at that organization will be recognized, which will drive the performance of the entire group to a higher level. And as the entire performance grows, the market value of the company will grow. And then four, this organization will gain a reputation as a place to grow and work with the highest of achievers, which then four attracts new, highly motivated players and the cycle starts over. Now compare that to a company that is in a cycle of decline, which is probably somebody who is being led by an empire builder. When A players join this organization, they get boxed in and limited, then they become become A minus players because they begin to lose confidence. They aren't being used to their fullest abilities and therefore they begin to recede in motivation and then thereby reducing their own value, which will lead to a decreased market value for the entire organization. Then the organization will become known as a place for you to go and for your career to die, which then will deter other A players from joining the organization. So only B players will apply. If this doesn't change, eventually there will be a further downward spiral to where it will eventually go from B players to C players and so forth until the entire organization has no value. So some steps you can take to become a talent magnet, which means you are valuing your entire team and those around you and you are using them to their best ability is this. First, in your journal today, take a moment and write down eight to 10 people who you work closely with. Notice the things that they are really good at, the things that they do easily and freely. Don't just write down that they're good with Microsoft Excel, but take it a step further and think, wow, she's really good at modeling data. Why? Well, maybe she's a critical thinking genius. Do you see? Like if you take anybody's obvious talent, but then boil it down to a, a deeper level, what is really at the heart of that? That's the kind of thing you should do for all eight to 10 people that you wrote down in your journal. Once you made your list, test your hypothesis. For example, you can talk to others about what you think this person's superpower really is and see if they agree or if they have other insight. And then once you think you have truly identified all of the special talents of all these people, if you're the leader, use this information to make sure that these people are in roles where they can be challenged 
and then take this talent to a new level. If these people are your peers or there are other people you work with in your organization, then make sure you collaborate with them on projects when you need this very special brand of genius. The second discipline is the liberator. The opposite of a liberator is a tyrant. Liberators require people's best thinking versus a tyrant who creates a tense environment. When it's full of stress and anxiety, liberators create an intense environment that requires concentration, diligence, and energy. So do you hear the difference between tyrant who creates a tense environment and liberators who create an intense environment? Both environments are a lot, but one of them feels really great, like you're really doing something, like you're making a difference, and the other feels like somebody just has your thumb on you and you're stressed out all the time. In a liberator's environment, people are encouraged to think for themselves, but they also experience a deep obligation to do their best work. Tyrants build stress because people do not have control over their own environment, and this will cause people to hold back. Liberators create space for people to step up. This freedom to live up to expectations will build stability and generate forward momentum. Liberators do demand the best work, but they provide the space that will allow that work to happen. Some steps you can take to become a liberator are to one, quote unquote, play your chips. So try this. Give yourself five poker chips. One is worth two minutes, three are worth 90 seconds, and one is worth 30 seconds. During one of your meetings next week, very deliberately control your comments to only those that are the most essential. You may be surprised at what you learn. Others will have a chance to be heard and they will feel empowered to share their ideas. Another excellent byproduct of this is that it will have the additional benefit of increasing your executive presence, making you stand out as a leader. Think about when you're in a room or maybe when you're watching TV and you see the CEO or somebody of a company. Very often, or maybe even the president of the United States in a cabinet meeting on TV, when you see these types of things, often you'll see the leader sitting back with a thoughtful look on their face, listening intensely to all of their people. But if you notice, they aren't really saying much. All of the people will have something to say. And then when this person chimes in, everybody listens. That's what I'm talking about with executive presence. The less you talk, the more you listen, and the more that you offer the most essential thing you could say at the right time, you will elevate yourself. Another thing you can do to become a liberator is to label your opinions. Divide your opinions into soft opinions and hard opinions. When you're talking throughout the day, you will have many things that you want to share. A few of these you may be absolutely unwavering on. These become your hard opinions. There may be a multitude of other opinions that you have that you'd like to state, but you don't really want them to become, you know, a hard, fast rule. So label those as soft so that others know you're open to your mind being changed on these ones and so that they don't become accidental policy, you know, where you say something and so now the entire team or the entire organization starts realigning when that is not what you intended at all. The third thing is to make your mistakes known. Make the freedom to fail and then the expectation to grow and learn from your mistakes, an expectation for your entire team. In order to do this, you need to share your own mistakes. Then go the extra step to say what you've learned from that error and how you have systematically gone about improving yourself so that you don't make the same mistake again. This will encourage others to make similar changes. If you lead a team, encourage them to share their own mistakes at a team meeting. And then similarly, have them share what they learned and the steps they have taken to prevent that in the future. This will do a couple things. One, people will learn from each other. That way, hopefully, multiple people don't have to make the same mistakes. But also, it'll create a level of psychological safety for the entire team. A place where we can come, share our failures, and then work together. We, you know, even others can help you figure out a way to not have that mistake occur again, but you become a place where it's safe to share and safe to learn. And that will raise the entire ability of the entire team. The third discipline is the challenger. A challenger is the opposite of a know-it-all. Challengers define opportunities that challenge people to go beyond what they know how to do already versus know-it-alls who basically give directives to showcase their own knowledge. Do you know somebody who is in your own organization that can never just listen or can never just be in a room with a certain topic comes up, but then they feel the need to share every single thing they know about that topic for an extended 
extended period of time. And often everybody's staring at them like, okay, I got it. They know every single thing there is to know about cars. <laughs> or I don't know, something like that. But it happens a lot. And if those people would just take a breath and everybody already knows they know that they're the expert on that topic. So when leaders operate his challengers, they accelerate the performance of their whole team because people don't have to wait for them to think of it first. They will solve harder problems at an accelerated rate. When you know there's one brain in the room, one know-it-all who insists on making every single decision, the team will end up spending a lot of time waiting for decisions to be made. They'll get bored and they'll spend idle time not adding any value to the organization. It's very demotivating and it will ultimately drive organization into decline. So work on becoming a challenger. Some steps you can take are to go forward with extreme questions. So this week, when you go to your meetings, try really hard to not say any statements. Only ask questions. Try this with your kids at home too. For instance, you can say, what time is it? They'll say 8 p.m. You'll say, what do we do at 8 p.m.? They'll say, we get ready for bed. What do we do first? They'll say, we brush our teeth. You know, see what I'm saying? Where you can sort of get them to think of what they ought to be doing on their own without just saying it's bedtime, which kind of is directive and, you know, kind of bossy, <laughs> that there's a, another way to handle it. And you can do that with your team as well. When you start asking questions, they'll start thinking and they may, they'll, you'll be amazed at how much everybody already knows. You don't have to tell them every detail. They know. And the more you let them think of the answers and the more they talk, the more they will feel empowered to add their own value. A second activity you can do to become a challenger is to take your team on bus trips. What this is really is taking your team on like little field trips, little bus trips, go down to the factory floor, so to speak. If you're in the Navy, you might go visit a ship, talk to the users, talk to the users of products you develop or services you provide. Go to places where people shop for the thing you're selling or go meet people with the challenge you're trying to provide a solution for. And you'll be surprised at the ideas and information you will learn, but make sure you take others with you so they can have the same experience and learn and grow as well. This will lead to a very motivated organization because they will understand the work that they're doing and the way it directly impacts others, or they will find out things that other people need for them to do, it will have the effect of improving the entire organization. The third thing is to take a massive baby step. These baby steps, these are like small wins, low hanging fruit, or you know those just do it ideas. Some ideas are so big, you need a plan, you need money, you need somebody to approve it, you need decisions to be made, you need white papers to be written, you need meetings to be held. Sometimes some of the ideas are so simple, you just need to be like, yes, take care of that, just do it. And oftentimes leaders think of these ideas on their own. So they'll come up with a handful of these kind of very simple small wins. But what if you were encouraging your entire team and empowering them to find these ideas and bring them to you and then you could just implement them. So don't just use your own mind and your own ideas for small wins. Use everybody's ideas for these small wins and you will be surprised at how fast both your team stays motivated and they'll start noticing other ways to make things better and that you will and the entire organization will start running like a well-oiled machine. The fourth discipline is the debate maker. Debate makers access a wide spectrum of thinking and they do this in the form of rigorous debate before making any decision. The opposite of a debate maker is a decision maker. Somebody who only has a small inner circle, they have their little circle of trust and they don't really trust anybody else and they don't really include anybody else when they're trying to make a decision. So you definitely want to be a debate maker because by keeping your circle small, you're probably keeping yourself isolated from other ideas that could have massive improvements. Some steps you can take to become a debate maker are to one, ask really hard questions. So ask questions to your team and to others around you that really gets to the heart of the problem. And then sit back and listen. Just let everybody else do the talking while you hear their ideas. You already know your own ideas. So listen and hear everybody else's ideas. Then once you've heard everything, you need to ask for data. Don't just let their opinions rest on an anecdote. Ask for evidence, metrics, and data to back it up. That way you know when you go to make a big decision, something that's going to impact money and people and time, that you have 
have a good reason a, and a clear reason why you're making that decision. And then third, go beyond just the extroverted dominant voices in the room. It's very possible that those softer voices, the introverted people, have the more analytic minds. So make sure that you're hearing from all of the people who may have valuable information on the problem at hand. The fifth discipline of a multiplier is the investor. The investor gives other people ownership for the results and outcomes and then invests in their success versus a micromanager who manages every level of work to ensure it is completed the way that single person would do it. There's steps you can take to become an investor, which is one, let them know who's boss. And I don't mean you. (laughs) When you delegate something to your team, make it clear that they are both in charge of that task and that they are accountable for that task. So make them the boss. Then let nature take its course. Don't jump in and fix everything for other people. Let them try it. Let them venture out. Let them figure out what works. That is how they will learn. You can talk about it after the fact. Help them brush off if you need to. And then let them know that they can talk to you about what they learned. But do not say I told you so. Just let them learn and then let them bounce their ideas off of you once they realized the mistakes they've made. Or maybe they won't make any mistakes. But let nature take its course. The third thing is don't just point out problems. Find solutions. So when you're talking to people about various problems, don't just let them give you all the problems. Ask them the next question, which is, okay, now how do you propose we solve this problem? What should we now do to fix this? And then listen again to let them know their ideas of potential solutions to the problem at hand. And then the fourth thing is to hand back the pin. So with this one, picture a whiteboard in a conference room and picture the person who you have delegated to lead this project. And they're leading the project, they're taking charge, they're writing on the whiteboard, but they get to a point where they're where they think, oh, I don't really understand this. So they hand you the pin and you are an expert in this area. So it would be very easy for you to take that pin and then clarify everything so simply. And while it might be okay for you to give a couple of pointers to just keep the discussion moving, make sure you do that in as limited of a way as possible and hand back the pin to the person and let them know that they are the boss. This is where you can say something like, I'm glad to help you through this if you if you need assistance, but I'm really looking for you to lead it. You can say, I have your back. What do you need from me as you lead this? Like, just let them know this is their project and you're here, but they are the boss of this project. They're accountable. They're in charge and you hand them back the pin. I really love that idea because you can see times in in that exact scenario where somebody says, oh, here, let me, here, let me have a marker. And then they, they basically take over the whole conversation, but it wasn't necessary for that to occur. So make sure that you aren't the person that tries to dominate conversations, discussions, whiteboarding sessions, and needlessly. Okay, so to make sure you're moving toward the multiplier end of the spectrum, I want you to take some of the actionable steps that we discussed here today and work them into your goal habit tracker. Literally check off the number of days that you take a couple of these steps and work them into your plan. For instance, the poker chip idea. If you decide I'm gonna gonna have a 30 day challenge and I'm gonna do the poker chip thing for 30 days at every meeting I'm at, then actually check off in your goal planner on your habit tracker, the number of days that you actually implement the poker chip plan. That's a good example. Little by little, you'll begin to change or improve who you are. When you read this book, the easiest thing will be to think about people you know who are multipliers and especially diminishers. They will pop out. You'll, you will realize you will see actual faces of the diminishers in your life. But trust me, so will other people. And sometimes the diminishers face will look like you. So even though this is human nature, don't read this book just to pick out who the diminishers in your life are. Read this book with the idea that you are going to take the steps to make sure that you are a multiplier. None of us are perfect, but make Make sure that you're taking the steps and reminding yourself every day to try and be a multiplier most of the time. Still, diminishers are real and you will come in contact with them. You may be on teams with them. They might be your leader. They could be a really senior person in your organization. And honestly, they might not even be aware that they are a diminisher. One of the best reasons to read this book is to find out more about accidental diminishers. You might be an accidental diminisher and you might think you're doing good, right things for other people. Uh, There's a quiz to let you know if you are an accidental diminisher. It's at thewisemangroup.com slash quiz. I'll link it in the show notes. Liz Wiseman is the author of this book. So it's on her website, but I did take the quiz 
And some of the questions were things like, when you see your team struggling, do you stop what you're doing and offer them advice and help them through the challenge? So do you see what I mean? That question right there, that activity doesn't seem like you're doing the wrong thing. It seems like you're helping or that you're being supportive or that you care about them. But back in this episode where we already discussed the investor versus the micromanager uh, discipline, then you know that this is actually a micromanager tendency and you should try to avoid doing it. So that's just one example, but there's other ways that I think really will surprise you and where you will find out that you are accidentally diminishing your team or others around you. So I would encourage you to read the book and then also to take this quiz to help you figure that out. When I took the quiz, it did give feedback after the fact so that you can figure out the areas that you need to focus on the most. So who will you choose to be? Do you choose to be a multiplier or a diminisher? You do have the power to change the world and you will make the biggest impact if you go forward with the heart of a multiplier. You can connect with us on Facebook at Genuine Driven Women or to learn more about what we offer, check out GenuineDrivenWomen.com.